<laughs> Hi everyone. Today we are going to talk about missing data and other real world problems. Uh, these are things that probably deserve a lot more attention than we normally give them. I want to at least hit on them so you could be introduced to these ideas and how uh, you might be able to address them. In real life, this is going to take more thinking than we're going to be able to give it here. But I want to at least bring it to your attention so that you'll be ready to address it. Uh, this is funny. We'll move on. So I love this view of talking about three levels of missing data. Uh, in the social sciences, we generally have uh, each of these levels happening in a data set, especially when we've collected it from enough people that there's going to be missing in different ways. So the first way is this item level missingness. This is just when, let's say, you have a scale that you're working with, let's say depression, and it has multiple items in it. There's multiple measures for it. Uh, item level missingness is just one of the items or a couple of the items are missing, but you still have some information on the rest of the construct. So that's item level missingness. You also have construct level missingness, and this is where you have missing across the whole construct. So the whole measure for that idea is missing. So in this case, we have the x1, x2, x3 measuring all of x, that construct, and then we have y where it's just a single measure of that construct. So construct level is would be missing all of the x's, like for person two here, or missing their y value. So technically, you can think of uh, when you have a single item measure, it can be item level or construct level. It's the same in that case, but we're going to call it construct level because it's a bigger problem. Uh, happening with your missingness on Y. Then the last one is person level missingness, and this is where the individual just doesn't have any information. They didn't give you X or Y information at all. That's person level missingness. The seriousness of the missingness depends on the situation itself, but as you get more and more missingness, it's, there's less that you can actually do to help the situation. There's also three mechanisms of missing data. So we talked about three levels. Now there's three mechanisms. These are the ways that missingness kind of comes about. What makes it? Uh, why did that person miss that item or that construct? And so the three are missing completely at random, MCAR for short, missing at random, MAR, or missing not at random, MNAR is often what people say. The names are not immediately obvious what they mean. Uh, and I'm sorry about that. This is just how it is. If you really get to know what they mean, it actually starts to make a little bit more sense but at face value, they're not super obvious. So let's go talk about each of these. So the first one, it's where the missing values are totally random or have nothing to do with the study and are not related to the missing values themselves. So missing completely at random is the best case scenario. It's where the missingness just kind of happened. Uh, for example, you might have someone taking a study and they just happened to overlook a question. Uh, it wasn't because they didn't want to answer it. It's not because of some characteristic of themselves. It had nothing to do with the study or them. It's just random. So that is your best case scenario, MCAR. So they're not related to anything about the study and they're not related to the missing values themselves. So you're not missing the information that would tell you why you're missing. Missing at random is actually where the missing values are partly related to the variables measured in the study, but are not related to the missing values themselves. So to think about this one, this means that we measured things 
in our study that actually help us understand why those values are missing. But the missingness isn't actually related to the missing values that we don't have. So M car is saying it has nothing to do with anything with the study. M or just mar is they are missing systematically in some way. They're related to the study, but we measured variables that actually tell us about that. So there's some ways that we can maybe intervene or control for it. But again, it's relying on the missingness is not related to the missing values themselves. And I've said that a few times and maybe it's confusing, but the idea is if you have information that would have been contained in the missing values, whatever they were, and that information is actually related to why they're missing. So I didn't answer this question because I don't want to answer that specific question because it has something to do with me that I don't want to talk about. That would be one example of the missing being related to the missing values themselves. So for MAR, that is not the case. They are not related to, the missing values are not related to, the, to themselves, but are related to other variables like gender or uh, work experience or something like that. And then we have this last one, MNAR, missing not at random. This is where the missing values are not random at all and are related to the missing values themselves. This one is extremely problematic in your study because it tells you that your missing values are missing for reasons that you cannot know because they are missing. That means your results have a high chance of being biased because uh, the missing values are missing uh, with information that you absolutely need in order to have unbiased results. So I like this quote that says, missing data are almost never missing completely at random. That is the ideal case, but it doesn't happen very often. And I'm gonna give some examples of why that might be the case. So first, if we're looking missing completely at random, again, the missing values are totally random, have nothing to do with the study and are not related to the missing values themselves. First example is a random internet outing occurred while a participant was taking the online survey. So a participant is just taking the survey and randomly the internet goes out for an entire region. Now, you got to think to yourself, would it be missing completely at random if the internet outing, even though it was random, happened for individuals that had cheaper internet? So if we think about that, then maybe it's because they couldn't afford more expensive internet. And so it actually has something to do with the individual themselves that they are not high income individuals. And then that would change if we measured that variable, that would change this to missing at random because it is actually related to something that we measured. Another example, some participants are colorblind and could not accurately see the stimulus in the experiment when the study has nothing to do with colorblindness or anything related to it. So that's another case where it's just kind of random. That's just a random genetic uh, marker essentially. And so individuals that are colorblind, it just couldn't accurately see the stimulus, but if that has nothing to do with the study, then, then you might be just fine. Last example here is you randomly assign individuals to miss different parts of the survey because it's so long you were concerned about fatigue and people just not finishing it. This is actually a design called a planned missing design. Uh, it's used pretty often. And if you just randomly assign people to miss different parts of the survey, then their missingness is completely at random and has nothing to do with them. And so it doesn't bias your results. Now missing at random, again, it's the missing values are partly related to variables measured in the study but are not related to the missing values themselves. So you 
have some information to guide you about why they're missing. So some examples. Some individuals did not show up for one of the experiments because they have children home from school that day. And maybe your study includes measures about their family, how, how many kids they have or if they have kids. Another one, individuals with disabilities do not complete the survey due to lack of accessibility for some of the items. Or you measure disability status and the study is not about individuals with disabilities. So again, they're not missing on items that would actually tell you why they were missing, but rather they're just missing because they had uh, disabilities and you didn't build in the right accessibility options for them. But again, the study is not about individuals with disabilities. So uh, it's random uh, in that it's not related to the missing values themselves and you measured something that tells you about why they're missing there. So that's missing at random. Now when it comes to missing not at random, this is where the missing values are not random at all and are related to the missing values themselves. An example, some individuals did not show up for one of the experiments about health because they had a marathon that they were participating in. So we're studying health and someone didn't show up because they are extremely healthy. That is going to bias our result. We can't measure something about their health because they are not there. Another one, people in the control group stop participating. This one you have happen quite a bit. It's where the control group itself is just not all that pleasant. And so people don't go, maybe it's not rewarding. Maybe they knew what the study was about and pretty quickly they realized you're not giving me what I came here for. So I'm just not gonna participate anymore. That is missing, not at random. And then the last one, some claim that GRE has nothing to do with student performance in graduate school, but all those that scored low on the GRE are not in graduate school. Therefore, they are missing. So this is actually a missing, not a random problem. So some claim that the GRE is not a good measure of student performance in graduate school, but the ones that scored really low on it are generally not actually included in graduate school. So all we're getting are those that scored really high on the GRE. We don't actually know any information on those that scored low, and so we can't know how well they performed in graduate school. So this is missing not at random, and this is a common occurrence when we are using a test for claiming performance when that same test is also being used to make decisions about who and who isn't involved in the study. So with those in mind, we, we have different levels of missingness and we have different mechanisms of missingness. So how can we handle missing data? Well, the easiest and the default, but not the ideal, is a case-wise deletion. So if you have missing on anything that is involved in the regression analysis, then that person just isn't included. So if we have a regression that's showing health of someone being predicted by exercise and age, if they're missing on any of those variables, then they're just not gonna be included in the model. This can bias your results, uh, especially in cases where maybe they still have some information but are missing on one thing. There's an alternative, and these two, the multiple imputation and FIML, are very similar uh, and are actually better in most situations, but tend to be more difficult to actually do. When it comes to both of these, they actually perform similarly when you have MAR or MCAR. When you have measured variables that tell us about the missingness, these will use that information to understand the missingness in the model itself. Multiple imputation is basically where it guesses a bunch of different ways based on information that you have about these people. FIML is a really cool model-based approach that just makes the estimate based on the model itself using the information that it does have. Both 
actually perform very similarly in many situations. To provide some examples of femoral and multiple imputation, you may recall from the previous in-class activity that the GSS dataset had some missing data. But there we just used case-wise deletion, so we didn't even really look at anything to do with the, the messiness. So let's say we decided not to use case-wise deletion. How could we actually go about using femoral or multiple imputation? So first, we're going to try femoral. Uh, to do this one, we need to use a package called Lavan. You can see it there on the screen. L-A-V-A-A-N stands for Latent Variable Analysis. What we do is we create a little model object. It's just in quotes. It's just a text object that looks just like the formulas we've used before with regression. So we have the log of income predicted by age and the log of education. And this one, we're going to use the SEM function instead of the LM function. We'll give it the model, which we just made right above it. We'll tell it what the data is. In this case, we're using the GSS. Missing is FIML. And fix.x equals false tells it to uh, use all the data, basically. And then we're going to just pipe that into a summary to see what it looks like. And this is what it looks like. We have age and log of education with their estimates, their standard errors, their Z value in this case, because it's using a slightly different estimation technique, but it's very close to a T and then a, a P value. So in this one, we have an estimate of 1.45 on the log of education, predicting the log of income. We can also use multiple imputation with the GSS data set. And this one, we'll use the mice package. And we'll, we first create uh, an imputed uh, data set. So we're going to do impute GSS. And that's going to be based on the GSS data. We're just going to select the variables we want, which is log income, age, and log education. And then we're going to use the mice function, which is going to actually create the impute imputed data set. So we're going to have five data sets, is what the M is saying. Each of those is going to be based on 50 iterations trying to guess. And we're going to use this PMM method. It's one of the simplest ones for the guessing. And then the seed just tells us the starting point so that we can replicate our work every time. And then with that, we're going to use the with function, tell it the imputed data set we're going to use, and we're going to tell it the model we're using. And then we're going to use the pool function to combine all those models together. So with the with function, that line happening here, we have the model fit to each of the five data sets, each of the guesses. And then we're going to combine those with the pool function into one model, which takes into account the uncertainty in all of our guesses. And then we're going to do the summary of that. When we do that, it looks like this. So we have age and log of education with their estimates and the p-values. You'll note in this case, our estimates are slightly different. So if you look at these, we have the estimate on log of education as 1.45 and log of education for the Multiple imputation is 1.255. So they are slightly different, but you'll note that the conclusions are still the same. We would still say there's a significant uh, effect of education on income and not a significant effect of age on income. And the age estimate is right around zero. So they, they are slightly different in this case, but they are very similar in conclusions. As your sample size gets bigger, and as the information contained in your data set is better, the closer these will align to each other. OK, so that is our uh, discussion about missing data. We're going to do a really short discussion about each of these five topics. We're going to talk about Likert data, which is really common in the social sciences. We have categorical continuous variables. 
Uh, what I mean by that is like when you categorize, so you have ages three to five, six to 10. So that's technically a continuous variable underneath, but the way we measure it is categorical. Uh, the select all that apply questions are really common and they're not super easy to work with from a data analysis standpoint. So we're gonna talk about those rank order questions and then the zero value transformations, which uh, you run into with things like log transformation. So we'll talk about each of those. So first, the Likert data, data. If you haven't seen Likert type data, there are things like strongly disagree to strong, strongly agree questions, uh, where you have like strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, strongly agree, stuff like that, or just rating one to seven. How do you feel today on a scale of one to seven with one being horrible, seven being amazing? So they're not truly continuous and have often weird distributions. For a lot of questions, people are all like right at the ceiling. So they're right at the top of the scale or all at the bottom, depending on what the question is. The uh, issue with that is it doesn't contain as much information as a truly continuous variable would. So most just recommend to treat it like an ordinal variable. So it's not as a continuous variable. So you would treat it as semi-categorical, but with order to it. But there's a rule of thumb, and I say this very lightly, but if the distribution is roughly normal, where there's uh, a lot of the values are represented and a lot are in the middle, and there's more than seven options, then sometimes this can be relaxed and it can be assumed to be continuous. But often in a lot of the cases where we have Likert data, that is not the case. And so we really should treat it as ordinal an ordinal variable. Now, often the best way to really talk about Likert data is just descriptive statistics. And there's a cool package called Likert in R that shows you how to analyze this data, not in a regression framework, but just descriptively in a way that makes it so you can get a lot of information out. I put the link here if you're interested in going there. The next topic is categorical continuous variables. So it's best if treated like ordinal or categorical but you'll see some actually turn them into a continuous variable. The issue with that is you have to pick a point that represents that category. For example, if we have ages three to five and six to 10 in a survey, if we want to treat this as a continuous variable, we have to decide what age best represents three to five. Is it four? Is it three, five? What, what is it? Same with six through 10. And so you do have to make a decision and it's going to be arbitrary. I've seen a lot of people just pick the middle point and they treat it as continuous from there. Uh, but the issue with treating it like continuous introduces measurement error, which we're going to talk about a lot uh, in our uh, next lecture. And so it's not a great way of approaching it. And so often it's best to just treat it like an ordinal or categorical variable because that is how it was measured. So select all that apply situations are where you say, so here are some options that you can choose from. Select all that actually apply to you. Now, what, one issue with this is all variables need to have a single mutually exclusive value to use in regression or basically any formal statistics. So one way is to create a variable for each option in a select all that apply. So you say, did they select this one? at some point, yes or no? Did they select this one? And they're all different variables. Another way is to code them as a single answer or two answers or three answers. For example, if they only selected one, they would just go under single answer. If they selected two of the options, you'd do two answers, etc. Or you can do a combination of both approaches where you actually say, uh, if the pattern is clear enough, you can say, uh, these people selected these three, these ones selected these two, these ones selected these ones, and as long as those are all mutually exclusive groups, so group one, two, and three in that case, then you can use that as a single variable in, in a regression. This often takes a lot of work and a lot of thinking to use the information most wisely. But one thing I would recommend is 
seriously consider when you're developing a survey if select all that apply is necessary or not. If it's not necessary, do not go there. It's just much more difficult to work with. And then you have rank order questions. Those are questions that look like rank all the following items from least enjoyed to most enjoyed. So you have a number of items, let's say three. And you look at, so item one you think is the least, so you put a three there. The second one you think, oh, that's the most enjoyable, so I'll put a one. And then that leaves me with the third one, it's somewhere in the middle, so two. Now, these aren't often analyzed in a regression framework. Often you just show what like the average rank for that item is or the median rank or the mode. But technically you could use them in a regression as a predictor or an outcome, but it would need to be seriously thought out if you could treat it as continuous or not. Last one is when you need to use a transformation of some sort, like a log transformation, uh, some of those can't have any zeros in it, but let's say your variable does have zeros, what do you do? Well, it is complicated, but there are three potential solutions. The first one is use another transformation that will work like a square root that can handle zeros. You can use GLMs, which we're gonna discuss later in the class, uh, which can handle weirder um, distribution of the, the outcome variable or you can add a small constant to the variable. This one is a little bit less certain. There's a lot of arbitrariness attached to this one. But I did attach a link here if you wanna read more about that one. In general, we'll talk about log transformations and other nonlinear models later on in unit three. So be sitting tight on that one. But just so you know, if we ever have to do a log transformation, and you have zeros in your variables, it's going to throw an error, and you have to think through what other approach do I have. We're not gonna give you the, the tools to use that in full yet, just wanted to bring it to your attention now. So this is really just a very brief introduction to these ideas. I was hoping to highlight some ways that things can go wrong now before you start to get too far into practicing with data. So you can see that these do happen and they happen quite a bit and that there are ways to work around them. If you're interested in learning more, here's some resources about missing data, multiple imputation and FIML. All great ways with missing data. If you have questions about the other real world problems, please reach out. Those are common and we just always have to think deeply through what your situation really means in light of the data that you have and your research questions. Well, thank you.